So I think what we're going to do um, for this session is we're going to start bringing people in so we can see everybody. Um, it's meant to be a pretty informal um, discussion, kind of question and answer um, with Dr. Bauer here, who we're so lucky to have. This is the session, Pediatric Thyroid can Cancer, Ask a Doctor Your Questions About Pediatric Thyroid Cancer um, from Minimally Invasive to Advanced Disease. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Bauer. He said to keep it short um, because he has so many experiences. <laughs> So he's obviously amazing. Um, he's been with us um, for years, um, helping us out um, in regards to pediatric thyroid cancer. So um, I will shorten it up, but say I'm so excited, very honored to introduce Dr. Bauer. Um, they definitely saved the best for the last day of the conference. So um, again, we will open this up to anybody who has questions uh, to Dr. Bauer. If you want to put those questions in the Q and A, um, he'll be looking at those, and um, we'll we probably have a, a very small group, so that's that's very nice. So, um, Dr. Bauer, if you want to take it away, we can get started. Sure. Welcome, everybody. Um, and I guess we'll just open it up for questions. Whoever wants to start asking questions. Yeah, our daughter was diagnosed over the summer after having a hot nodule um, found last year. And she's still, she had a partial or she had a, a lobectomy and then a completion surgery. Um, and her completion surgery was last month. So we were just wondering, she's still getting her levels figured out. And so my questions pertain to that, the current guidelines on that. So yeah, it's on the question and answer. So how, how much levothyroxine do you use as far as what the TSH target is? Yeah. What's the Just question? what number for TSH is optimal? Right. So, you know, we've, in our first version of the guidelines, which were published in 2015, um, you know, the goal is to keep it at 0 0.5, around 0 0.5 for low risk to, to 1.0 for a TSH. I think that's still because we're working on a revision for the guidelines right now. Hopefully they'll be out next year. And that still is the case. So it depends on, you know, each patient, if you're in low risk, intermediate risk or high risk. And the risk is if there's any disease left after surgery, which will help guide if you should get radioactive iodine, but also help guide the frequency of getting labs and the target of the TSH. So all those things kind of roll into the risk levels. So if, if your daughter had, you know, low invasive disease, which means it was mostly confined to the thyroid, um, mm -hmm. then the goal is to keep it towards the lower end of the normal range for TSH. So most TSH normal ranges go from half to four and a half and somewhere around 0 0.5 should be adequate. Um, and you balance that with how the person feels, usually we get away with being able to do that and the person feels fine. But if the person feels anxious or jittery or nervous, because that's what happens if you give someone too much thyroid hormone, then it could even be adjusted to allow it to come up a little bit closer to the 1.0 level. So there's no, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, but as you know, TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. So we try to keep that number on the lower side. And as time goes on, if the numbers are reassuring, the thyroid globulin and the anti-thyroid globulin, then you can even let it come up into the one to two range, you know, once you have confidence that um, everything has been treated. Okay. So you would say in either of those scenarios, under two would be a pretty solid goal. We've been going back and forth with our current. Well, so far she's, she's still at almost five. They have, they're still titrating it and her calcium is still messed up or parathyroids are not working yet um mm. but he had said oh yeah overall maybe up to three would be fine and she she's just sleeping all the time and hair falling out not feeling well so we're you know just wondering if we can possibly have a lower target if, if that would make her feel any better yeah i i think three sounds like on the high side <laughs> you know for that first year or two i would try to keep it closer to one okay. um and Tired all the time is understandable for a couple of reasons. One, just the stress and anxiety yeah. of the diagnosis. Two, if she was had a hot nodule, it depends on how hot it was. That might have, you know, some 
a lot of patients don't have very many symptoms, but they still, looking back, probably don't feel completely normal because the yeah, thyroid levels aren't normal. Right. Yeah. And then surgery, that's tiring in and of itself. And then two surgeries, so that's like the double whammy. Um, and now still a TSH of five, like she has every reason to be tired. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it will get better. You just have to kind of get the TSH where you want it to be. And then that's when the recovery phase will happen. The, the brittle hair, if you're hypothyroid, um, once you normalize the TSH, that also can take some months to recover. Hmm. So yeah. everything does get better, but she sounds like she's in that feeling kind of crummy stage. Yeah, um, she's just still waiting for the upswing, I think. <laughs> right, right. But I would push the TSH, like how, what you know what her current dose is. Is it 125? Yeah, 125. Uh, it's a reasonable dose. And again, reasonable is you know you're 13 it's 125 but everyone metabolizes it differently so if she needs 137 it's not good or bad it just is what it is right he was actually right. saying that he probably thought she would but wanted to get there in a incremental fashion so yeah. there's no yeah i mean we usually make a dose change wait four to six weeks you know four mm -hmm. is on the shorter end six is on the longer end and if she's feeling crummy i even though it's not fun to get your labs every month, I'd rather get them every month and get to where you want to be faster than right. dragging them over. She's the whole getting her out. calcium drawn every three days at yeah. this point. So. Every three days. Wow. Yeah, it's That's really, really been frequent. hard to get her to stabilize. Yeah, she's been a trooper. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that's also tiring. Wow, she's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's on the supplementation and stuff for that too. So she's all over the place, but we're just trying to look long-term what, what the optimal kind of goal would be so it sounds like the tsh yeah 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 i'd get it to... closer to one okay yeah that's yeah. great thank you so much we really appreciate it yeah. okay looks like we have another question question from lynn yep i was just reading it so yeah. both my brother and i were diagnosed with pathway thyroid cancer within 10 months um a couple of years ago both in our 60s that's a great question so there, there are families that have familial papillary thyroid cancer, we call it familial non-medullary thyroid cancer. Um, and if it's an isolated form of papillary thyroid cancer, which means not associated with other tumors, there really isn't a genetic test. So the, the types of familial thyroid cancer, there's medullary, and that's multiple endocrine neoplasia type two. Um, and then in differentiated thyroid cancer, the two actually there's three, but the one doesn't have a genetic test that we know about that run in families is Dicer 1. Um, that's a specific tumor syndrome. And that's associated with lung tumors in newborns and multinodular goiter and, and differentiated thyroid cancer in um, adults. Um, ovarian tumors that produce male hormone um, and a long, long list of kind of less common tumors. And then P10 hamartoma tumor syndrome, which is a thyroid cancer associated with women with breast cancer and endometrial cancer, uh, renal cancer in both sexes, and colon cancer. So if it's a thyroid cancer that's associated with other cancers that fall into Dicer 1 or P10, there is a genetic test. Those are the genes that we can test for. Dicer 1 is a gene, P10 is a gene. But the other ones, if it's just by itself, thyroid cancer, pathway thyroid cancer, there is no genetic test as of 20, you know, 2022. So um, what, we, what the papers would say is you have to have three first degree relatives to kind of meet the definition of this familial thyroid cancer um, diagnosis. And so if it's the two of you, I mean, that's pretty close to three and you might consider at least having other first degree relatives have a physical exam. I mean, that's a pretty easy way to, to see if, and feel if you have a nodule or um, if there's a lot of anxiousness, it depends on each person in each family, maybe a thyroid ultrasound, but there's no blood test that we can test for. And I do have a question. I know you know Dr. Bauer. <laughs> I know you're- yeah. um, So <laughs> I, I have a question for you. Are you, I know you guys do research all the time, but what is the newest or sort of the newest research you're doing on thyroid cancer? We're kind of working towards it, if that makes sense. One of the research projects we're currently actually close to publishing is looking at quality of life 
you know, for kids with papillary thyroid cancer, which there isn't a lot of research on that. Um, and what we've discovered with our initial studies and kind of the paper that's going to come out will say as well is that it is something that is equally stressful. Um, so it doesn't matter really what the outcome of the cancer is. Cancers that are treatable still cause a lot of anxiousness for that person. And so, you know, initially patients do well and they may still have a period of time when that's in post-traumatic stress because they had no symptoms prior to the diagnosis. And then they go through all the stuff that you guys go through, you know, with the biopsies and surgery and radioactive iodine and all those things have a significant impact. And we need to do a better job of asking patients how they're doing and families and then helping them, you know, in an organized way, work through those, that, that adjustment. So that's one, I think, exciting and important um, contribution that hopefully other centers will, will take light of and make sure those resources are available and every patient needs to be asked about those. And then the interesting, um, two interesting research projects in the lab that we have going on. So we have a couple mouse models that develop thyroid cancer and one of them is actually an N-track fusion mouse model. So we're, we're trying to see how that turns it, works out as far as if it develops tumors like people do. But we're trying to figure out why some of these new drugs that are specific to make thyroid cancers not grow, we call them you know, genetic, specific genetic inhibitory drugs like NTRAC inhibitors and RET inhibitors, ALK inhibitors, how they actually work to make tumors not grow and do they actually kill the tumor cells? And in the meantime, how do they make it so that radioactive iodine appears to be absorbed more efficiently by the cells, because we see that in the clinic, we just don't understand that yet at the cell level. So we have a, a project funded by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and also through the Department of Defense to, to look into why those drugs work, um, to what extent do they work, for how long do they work, and what happens when they stop working. And so those are kind of the couple of the cool things that we're doing. The other paper that we have that's going to be published this year, um, kind of talking back to the talking about the group of patients on the other side of this spectrum are the low risk patients, and we have some research now that's going to come out this year. Like, how do you use this information from the genetic changes that happen in cells that we call driver changes? So it's usually in the thyroid cancer cell. It's not something that's passed between generations, but before you even have surgery. There are some types of genetic changes that are associated with high risk disease, which means it's going to spread, and some that's associated with low risk disease. And can we adjust surgery based on knowing what that genetic change is prior to surgery? And so our preliminary data actually shows that that's possible. And so we're starting to use genetics, not just for the patients that are harder to treat, but also to identify the patients that might benefit which would mean saving half a thyroid, which would be a big benefit for someone's lifetime um, by knowing that information even before surgery. So we're trying to try to focus our research on how people do overall, you know, day-to-day -day clinic stuff. And then how what can we do to adjust how we're treating patients, both patients that need less treatment and what information can we get to determine what they need for less treatment and if it's safe. And then at the other end, if they need more treatment, you know, what can we use to help decrease the potential complications and more treatment, which, which would be how can you reduce, you know, how can you make the cancer go away maybe with one dose of radioactive iodine or two doses rather than three, four, five, and six doses that some patients ultimately end up getting. Any other questions? I have uh, one more question, if, uh, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, so you kind of already touched base on, on this earlier um, with risk and, um, genetic testing for patients. Is there any standard um, testing or analysis that should be done on tumors taken out of pediatric patients um, for low risk, high risk, any of those? Yeah, it, there, it's an interesting and a difficult question. So it comes down to who's gonna pay for testing, right? And so the insurance companies would say, we're only going to pay for a test if there's something that you're going to use the information to change your treatment approach, right? And even then, sometimes we have to beg <laughs> to get insurances to approve. So most of the time, 
the testing that gets covered are either patients before surgery, if they have a biopsy and the results are indeterminate. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a couple commercial tests that are available from different labs. Um, it just depends which, which ones your hospital uses. And then um, the, only two or three of them are actually kind of validated, which is a scientifically validated versus clinically validated, more clinically validated within pediatrics. And one that's not that oftentimes, unfortunately, is used in a pediatric patient. We don't know two to the results. So there are commercial tests. It, it just depends on making sure the right one's ordered um, based on pediatrics, which is different than adults. In the post-surgery time frame, usually the only time that tests would be covered is if a patient develops refractory disease where they where radioactive iodine is not working anymore and they're thinking about using one of these systemic oral chemotherapy drugs. And then insurance will typically cover that because there are some drugs that we can use if you don't know the genetic change, um, multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but most of the newer drugs, which are FDA approved, are specific to whatever the changes in the cells from that particular patient. So as I talked about earlier, an NTREC yeah. fusion or a fusion or whatever. So you have to know what that is to know what to pick, which drug to pick. And oncologists seem to get things approved a little bit easier. And so that's why I work with um, uh, oncologists. Ted Leach is the oncologist that I work with at CHOP um, because they're the ones that are going to prescribe these drugs and they're the ones who can help get the testing done and usually get approved. So uh, outside of that, outside of the, you don't know for sure what it is pre-surgery or you're not responding to treatment, me me meaning you still have disease and radioactive iodine isn't getting rid of it, time frame, most of the other testing would be research testing. And so that is also something that we're, you know, interested in doing. It just depends on funding. And unfortunately, there isn't a ton of funding for thyroid cancer and even less so for pediatric thyroid cancer. So we're building, um, we called it the Child and Adolescent Thyroid Consortium, the CAT-C. And we have um, 10 sites on board right now. And there's about 25 in the United States that are interested in joining our efforts. And then a couple international sites. And through that effort, um, there will be a bio repository where re some research testing will be performed. Oh, the, and the last test, which I just found out about this week, just reminded me also is um, the Children's Oncology Group is also offering a free testing, clinical testing, on I think almost all cancers in pediatrics uh, funded through the National Cancer Institute. So for your daughter, if she had tissue that's available, if you work with your, your oncologist, they should be able to access the children's oncology group um, and arrange to get that tested if they can't get it uh, covered locally. And if you and if you want, just you can contact us even you know offline um, if you can't find out how to get that done. I can and we can connect you to whoever we have to connect you to or or have your doctor. But most of the doctors can find out this information. Mostly on cancer doctors and oncologists can find that information through the COG, mm -hmm. Children's Oncology Group. Yeah, for some reason, so we're through the Kaiser system in California and they don't give an oncologist for thyroid cancer. They only give you a pediatric endocrinologist. But I guess that's just mm -hmm. a creation. But I'm sure we well, can. yeah, I mean, if you send us a message or something, we can at least try to connect you and see, yeah. see what can be done as far as finding someone because they, they have pediatric oncologists in Kaiser, right? Yes, they do. <laughs> we asked. Yeah. yeah, we asked. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see what we can work out. Just let contact us through Thyka and we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I know in our case, it was a different story. We have two different mutations. We had the P10 and the Dicer one, but we're... Um, we're working with uh, Dr. Um, Chris Ann Schultz um, through Children's in Minnesota. And um, our my daughter's um, testing, again, this is germline testing, um, is being done for free um, through them, which is very nice of them, you know, to see what kind of mutation um, caused their thyroid cancer. Again, that's a little, little bit different, but. That's it. Chris Ann is a different registry. That's the PPB, the Dicer one that's, registry. Right. That's different. And the yeah. OTST. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, any, I know 
Kathy has a question too. Um, yeah, I have another one for you, Dr. Bauer. Um, is radioactive right. iodine still going to be used in pediatric patients in the future? That's a great question. I would say as of now, yes. Um, the question we're trying to figure out is, you know, for patients that have some disease left in their neck, it's a very good drug. Um, and so if you have surgery and you remove the majority of the cancer, then it can be used to get rid of the small amounts of cancer. It can't get, it, it's not very helpful if you have big lymph nodes that are left, that's surgery, you know, sometimes a second surgery to get rid of those. But for small disease that's left in your neck, it's usually pretty good. Um, for patients that have disease that spread to their lungs, radioactive iodine isn't that great to get rid of it. And that's where we're trying to figure out um, how these newer drugs can help us get rid of that. So in those patients, I think we will continue to use and rely on radioactive iodine, but the question will be, can we get away with giving lower doses and have those lower doses be more effective? And so that's where we're trying to figure out um, how, how to incorporate those drugs earlier on, because most of those drugs we wait, we, the current trend is to wait till someone doesn't respond, but the research that we're doing is even before the first dose of radioactive iodine, can you make that first dose even more effective? And so that's an important research question, um, but that's a long answer to the yes, we'll continue to use it. It just depends on the patient. The, the other, the flip of that, again, because there's always, you know, as everyone on the call knows, there's some patients that have disease that's harder to get rid of and some that seems to be a little bit more efficient to get rid of. Um, but we recently just looked at um, groups of patients that did or did not get radioactive iodine. So the ATA low risk category. And what we found is at the first earliest time point, which is typically a year after surgery, since we've incorporated the guidelines, the 2015 guidelines into practice, where it says if you have low risk disease, you don't need to get radioactive iodine because there's a low risk that anything's left after surgery. Um, at the one year mark, the majority of those patients without radioactive iodine um, had achieved remission. And so it was about 87% versus 86% and they re did receive and did not receive radioactive iodine group. Um, and then at last follow-up, which for the patients before 2015, we have more data because it was a longer time ago at five years as kind of the, um, the, t the last follow-up time versus about three years for the other group, it had even increased to um, into the low 90s. So not only was it, if you didn't get radic divide on your low risk, there's a very high chance it was all gone at one year, but as time went on, there was even more support that not giving radioactive iodine in the low risk group um, was not a negative, right? Because that's what we were trying to figure out. Like, did, if you didn't give it, did you end up with disease? No, in, in fact, if you didn't give it, there's a high likelihood you had the disease um, removed. And over time, it, the data was more and more supportive that that was true. So those, those patients, I think really, and, and there's now the first study in adults just published in New England Journal, um, looking at a big cohort of adult patients, but prospectively, which means they didn't get it and then they were followed versus retrospect is like, what did we do for the last 10 years, which there's a bigger advantage, obviously, to the prospective study. Um, they also established that recently in adults, finally in a prospective fashion. So, so there are some patients study that don't benefit from radioactive iodine and can achieve remission without it. Those are the ATA low risk group. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I know that Andrea, you were in a session, not to call you out, but with us yesterday and not sure if you have any questions at all for Dr. Bauer. Maybe not. That's okay. <laughs> no, okay. I'm just trying to connect. I'm trying to connect. Uh, no, I don't have any questions. I was just um, okay. just listening to see what everybody. I can share my my little bit of a story if if you want. Um, my son was diagnosed in May with papillary thyroid cancer. Um, he had a thyroidectomy and. Uh, uh, neck dissection, I think it was about 86 lymph nodes that they took out of his neck. Um, uh, it had traveled to his lungs 
He had his radioactive iodine uh, the beginning of September. He's 19, by the way. I, so I'm kind of just, um, so he had the surgery that was, that was good. Um, and then he had the radioactive iodine uh, the first week of September. And um, then the scan, seven days later, the scan showed it in three locations, his thyroid bed, which they said 100%, it would be there, um, the clavicle area and his lungs, which we knew the lungs would be there because of the CAT scan. Uh, so now the they just we just wait until December till he comes home for break and they'll do a scan um, probably of his neck and um, you know that area because it didn't show elsewhere. Um, but uh, what we're going through now is that he doesn't he he's he's struggling to feel well. He just doesn't feel well. But his 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 um, TSH was two point one. Um, uh, he's on 125 of his Synthroid. Um, you know, he's just got a lot of anxiety and, and this conference has been interesting for me to hear, I, I think because this happened so fast and he had no symptoms before. I mean, he, 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 he sent me a picture of his haircut and I noticed a lump in his neck and within five days they mm -hmm. had a biopsy every scan and surgery scheduled from from like a Thursday to uh, let's say seven days I mean it, it moved so fast and um, so here we are he 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 goes to NYU he, he went back to school one day after his scan and and he's you know living living life but um he, he doesn't seem to be too phased by having cancer but he's he doesn't feel well so that's that's where we're, you know, I mean, he's, he's not sitting in his room crying. He's, you know, living life, but, um, so I, I just want him to feel a little bit better, have a little more energy and, you know, not as anxious and overwhelmed and he's a sophomore. So it's not like he's a freshman and, you know, he, he, you know, so that that's where we're at, but all of the, the medical terminology that everybody's been talking about the T4 and we all, I don't know any of that. Like the only thing that I've ever, I mean, I can see the blood results. I can, I can see the results. So I, but um, suppression and different things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we haven't, I, I don't know if I'm, I haven't been told or I'm uneducated or um, mm -hmm. but it's just really that 2.1, the TSH number. It was the only blood test that the endocrinologist did last, last week. So I've, Two things, just listening. Um, sorry to hear you're going through that. That's, that's three things. It's the first one. <laughs> uh, and your son. Um, but, you know, for the most part, it, all of us are anxious about this. Um, and so hopefully with time, you'll realize and he'll realize, you know, our patients do quite well, like medically do well, right? Survival is 98%. So sure. this is a... a kind of a slow growing thing and it's something um that you know there's high survivability so things don't happen quickly which is good and bad all at the same time right because we want this to be quickly behind us <laughs> um but if they don't grow quickly and 90 percent of patients typically survive decades then it's you know we just have to enter into long-term surveillance mode and long-term treatment mode um and so that's kind of the good and the bad at the same time. But the, the only path really to, to decrease the anxiousness is to understand what's going on. And super important for you and for him to know what these terms are, to know what kind of cancer it was, to know what T4 and TSH is, to know what our goals of treatment are, um, because you don't just follow TSH, that's just how much medicine you're on. And, and that's a really important number, but that's a very small, part of the picture because the other two numbers that are important for the cancer are the thyroglobulin and the antithyroglobulin and those are our tumor markers to say how well did the treatment work and right. then the imaging as well whether it's an ultrasound or a ct scan sometimes a whole body scan so in december when he comes back or before december or whatever you can figure out for your schedule um if you're not getting the answers from 
where you are, you know, people in FICA can help come up, give you a list of questions to ask and they should be asked. Sure. Um, and if you're not getting those answers and you're not comfortable with the amount of education you're being provided, then seek out another opinion. Um, yeah, the nice sure. thing about the Northeast is there's chuck full of places that you could go. We're within driving distance, Boston within yeah. driving distance, there's good people in New York. Yeah. Um, everyone deserves, and you know, we have an obligation, it's not just deserving to educate yeah. our patients. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. the only way to, to figure out, to decrease the anxiousness, because otherwise I would be anxious as well, not knowing what's going on and not knowing sure. what they're looking for, not knowing how, you know, how things are going treatment wise. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I, I, I'm trying hard to uh, not do this, but I, I, I do think I need to get a different endocrinologist because I, I explained in, in detail what was happening and his, his response was call your PCP. Uh, you know, and yeah. I, I, right. I know, I know, I mean, that's, you know, you're, I, I just expected a little more of a whole, a whole per, you know, it, this is stressful for me. It's for him, for him. And just to say, Hey, look, you know, this is going on. And, the, and then just not, you know, just to kind of, you know, seek out counseling at school. <laughs> sounds, sounds like anxiety. Like I, I just, I can't get past it. And I told my husband, I'm, I'm going to really try hard because I want to like him because he's, you know, supposedly one of the best in Connecticut. I'm trying hard. But the bottom line is I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling the connection. So it's a little, so I, I know that that's in the horizon. I, I need to do the second he's, opinion. And he's, and he's seeing a pediatric or an adult endocrine. Oh, and adult. Um, yeah. He's 19. So, I mean, that's, right. you know, yeah, right. it's adult. So perhaps, perhaps it's a little, uh, more straightforward, maybe. Mm. So I, I, I mean, just, you know, yeah. So I don't know. Right. That's that's anyway. But that's well, again, that's, you, that's right or there. But you know, it's just right. Well, it's not. You know, if at any point, even our patients, my patients, um, anyone is, if they are wondering and they want a second opinion, they should. It shouldn't be a question. That you should just get a second opinion. <laughs> and if it's. Um, you're in Connecticut and there are other adult endocrinologists and you know if you're not going to an academic program sometimes that's you know the next place to go to whether it's Yale or, or yeah. wherever is closed for you or depending on what your insurance allows Boston is closed by Memorial yeah, Sloan is closed in. by yeah. there's, we can go there's really yeah there's really excellent um adult thyroidologist mm -hmm. within driving distance of Connecticut um and you should get that opinion you, you oh, yeah. It's an obligation of ours, yeah. our oath of office, our Hippocratic oath to educate our patients and have you guys understand. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a go ask somebody else. It's a sit down and let's talk about right. it. That's, well, it's sort of what I expected. That's what I expected. How can we, how can, you know, what, what, what do you want to know? How can, what can I answer? Not just, you know, a text yeah. like, yeah. so anyway, but, uh, but he yeah, seems like a find out. Mm -hmm. and yeah. ask somebody else like who do they who they go to and who they like and it's a long list of really awesome resources yeah yeah, yeah. yeah we talked a little bit about it yesterday i know too andrea just with yeah, you know, yeah. dr tuttle yeah i watched him yesterday yeah, yeah. Um, right, and stephanie fish there's a bunch of people at memorial sloan besides mike i mean obviously yeah. he's fabulous but it's a good group <laughs> huh? yeah, yeah and that would be easy for for Vinny because he's right there but i mean not right. easy when he's home in the summer, but easy during, you know, during right. school. But um, right. anyway, but uh, the surgeon, the initial, the surgical oncologist, Glenda Callender, she was absolutely fabulous. And I've heard multiple times throughout the weekend that the, that the, the surgeon, you know, that first surgery is so critical. And so for that, I couldn't be, um, I couldn't be happier. She was I mean, it was a nine hour surgery. She just really mm -hmm. fabulous. And that, I mean, was and that might be another person you could ask because yeah. she I'm sure works with other endocrinologists and you know, she, you don't have to say that. I don't like that person or I do like no, that person. Or I, I, I know, I didn't you can just say, these are a list of people I would send my kids to, right? That's the question I always get asked. <laughs> and that's yeah. the type of response you want to hear. 
Yeah, exactly. I was so glad too, that we got that second opinion from my daughter. You know, we went to MD Anderson, you know, to Dr. Waggis back, which, you know, he's one of the best also. Um, so glad we did it. And he, even though we didn't see him every year, he still consulted with our endocrinologist in the Midwest, Midwest here. So, I mean, I'd say definitely worth it getting that second opinion. Thanks, Andrea. Appreciate it. We do have a question here in the chat, Dr. Bauer. Um, sure. Roseberry, are there any studies that looked at PEDS long term? And then she has a second one. What is the difference in a low risk and high risk PEDS patient? Good questions. So I'm not, depends on my long term. Um, there's really only two studies that have looked at long term, decades long term, like 30, three to four decades post diagnosis. And they're kind of older studies now. One was from the Mayo Clinic and one was from um, out of the UK. And mostly looking at um, chance for recurrence or relapse, um, suggesting that. We, you know, our patients need lifelong follow-up because there is a chance for that to happen. So rather than just getting, if you don't have a thyroid, you get at least a TSH every year, but instead of just getting a TSH and a T4, always getting a thyroglobulin and antithyroglobulin at least once a year forever. Um, you may or may not need imaging with that, but at least lifelong surveillance. And through the CAT-C, I think that's one of our goals. Um, just in the five executive members, which is CHOP, MD Anderson, Boston, Yale, Sick Kids, Toronto, we have about 900 patients that are in the registry, and that's five centers, and we have 25 more to join. And so we should be able to generate better data um, from that type of study. Um, and some of the centers have really excellent long term data, like MD Anderson, Mayo, Memorial Sloan, others have a little bit less so because they may have been organized for a shorter period of time. Um, so some long-term data, but we need more, um, and we're working on getting more as far as what the risk levels are. So when we wrote the American Thyroid Association guidelines, one of the first goals was to try to stratify radioactive iodine from who and would and would not benefit from that. And that's, so the low risk is there's a low risk for any thyroid cancer left after surgery. High risk is there's a high likelihood of thyroid cancer left after surgery and intermediates obviously in between. And that's based on um, what the disease looked like on the initial ultrasound and how many lymph nodes were positive at the time of surgery. And so low risk, when we wrote the guidelines, we didn't have enough data to say how many define low risk. And now there's data since 2015 that defines it as less than or equal to five lymph nodes that were positive on the initial from the initial surgery so if there's you had your thyroid removed there's less than five lymph nodes that are positive there's a low risk that anything is left after surgery and a high likelihood that you would not need radioactive iodine and could achieve um, remission from disease you continue to get surveilled this is just initial post-surgery risk stratification um, high risk is if you have more than 10 lymph nodes from the central neck or the lateral neck um, that there's a high risk that there's something left after surgery. So those patients should get a whole body scan and they have a higher likelihood of at least getting a treatment dose of radioactive iodine. And so those are what the risk levels are. In the next version of the guidelines, um, those new lymph node numbers will be part of that. And now what we're trying to work on um, from a research standpoint is how, to, how can we involve genetics as well? Because we know there's some changes in the cells, we, you know, the driver mutations and fusions that are associated with a low risk and a high risk. So that we're trying to figure out also, you know, the more data we have from different sources, um, the more confident we may be able to be in defining what the risk level is. But that's what, that's what the risk is, not as far, as far as outcome, but as far as what's left after surgery. And then the other thing the new guideline, the new version of the guidelines will do is that first, that initial risk stratification will then be done at least on an annual basis. And we call that dynamic risk stratification, DRS. So every time a person comes in, because usually we see patients initially every three to six months and then every six to 12 months and then once a year. But once you get to that time frame, we're continuously assessing what does the data show? 
were you initially at intermediate risk and now you're at low risk? Were you initially at intermediate risk and now you're at high risk? Mm -hmm. And so we're constantly adjusting that to, to be better about how we're treating our patients that we can back off on how often we check labs and imaging, or we should mm -hmm. keep the same level or we should even increase the level because there's a chance that there's something left and there might be some other treatment that might be needed, whether it's a second surgery, second dose of radioactive iodine or something else. So those are the risk levels. There's an initial one, and then there's a, something called DRS, dynamic risk stratification. I have a question kind of related to that, and it was actually at one of my doctor's uh, daughter's doctor's appointments with Dr. Ryder, um, who speaks on here too, but um, I know it's too late for my daughter. She had follicular cancer, but she had brought up, which I'd never heard before, um, that I asked about the difference between like low risk, minimally invasive, and she says now what they do for follicular cancer is they look at the number of, and I don't know the technical name for it, but kind of breaks outside of the nodule. Like if it's less than three, then it's a lower risk of recurrence and it's more than four. So I thought that was really interesting. I'd never heard that. Yeah, so follicular thyroid cancer is less common than papillary thyroid cancer. Um, it's probably 5% or so in pediatrics. Um, and it's the same in adults, PTC is more common, FTC. So it used to be minimally invasive versus widely invasive follicular thyroid cancer. And that had to do with how many blood vessels in the, because most of these tumors have a capsule, like scar tissue that's wrapped around it. So if the tumor entered into those blood vessels, because that's how FTC spreads through the blood system, not through the lymphatic system, then you could define minimally invasive if it was less than three blood vessels in the capsular space, pericapsular space, um, or more than that, that would be more consistent with an angio invasive or a risk for more widely invasive disease. The, the uh, soon to be released World Health Organization Blue Book redefinition of this um, is actually gonna be changed a little bit. So it's gonna essentially say, if the tumor is trying to get through the capsule, not a blood vessel, but just through that scar tissue, that can be minimally invasive because that's still within the thyroid gland. But if any blood vessels are involved, not less than three, any blood vessels, large blood vessels in that scar tissue capsule that's wrapped around the tumor, then it's not a minimally invasive, it's called an angio-invasive thyroid cancer. And there's a chance and then that could spread. The, the challenge for FTC is um, it, could be, it could spread at the time of diagnosis um, or it could take up to five years later. So if it's angio-invasive follicular thyroid cancer, even if things look good initially, we really need long-term data to say, yes, we're out of the woods. And so I think we, it, it's gonna take a little bit of time to, once this, is, this change is made, like how do you still define giving radioactive iodine or not? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. if it's three blood vessels, because there's more, you give it up front just to make sure there wasn't anything just, you know, and the distant metastasis, if it was just one, it's still angioinvasive, but there's a lower risk. Um, and so that it, it just is a little bit different as far as how it spreads and how I think we're going to have to surveil for it and what the time frame before we have greater confidence to say everything's gone is really gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And I see we have a question here in the Q&A, and I know you see him. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, it's a, <laughs> yeah. So hi. It's a it's a great question. It's it's one that we tried to provide some guidance for in the 2000 version of our guidelines. And so we really don't believe that you continually need to do whole body scans if it's someone who had relatively low to intermediate disease as far as risk levels, and if the data after surgery plus minus radioactive iodine is very reassuring. And so in this case, if someone got radioactive iodine, most of the disease was local, the thyroid globulin is, is very low, it may not be undetectable, but 0 0.6 is very low and stable. And the thyroid globulin antibodies are either you know, negative or also very low. Um, then you may not need a whole body scan. It's not that it's a negative, it's a bad thing to do, but it's a little bit of a nuisance. And the question is, what are you, what are you looking for and what are you gonna do with the results? So you have to go on a two week low iodine diet, you either come off of that hormone you know, for two weeks or if insurance covers it, you use that recombinant human TSH. And 
if the TG is undetectable, it was disease limited to the neck, the neck and the TG is now 0.6 and the neck ultrasound is negative, the likelihood of distant metastasis is low and there's no real benefit for doing the whole body scan. If it's, but if it's a family that is very anxious and just really needs to prove that there's nothing left and that's just the last piece in the puzzle to say, I'm really confident that we're in remission, then sure, I mean, you always have to make adjustments. I call it the loose sleep factor between what I think is necessary based on you know, scientific data and being a reasonable person, you know, being a parent and, and trying to understand, like all of us have different levels of anxiousness. And if it takes a whole body scan to really be comfortable that everything's on, then sure, do the whole body scan. But it's not a necessary step um, for patients that had low risk disease to begin with and probably not for intermediate risk maybe a more beneficial test to do for patients who had high risk disease, which means they had distant metastasis. Um, and certainly something to do, the, the time where for sure it's beneficial is no matter what you presented with, if your TG level is still you know, relatively elevated five or higher, not stimulated, um, and we can't figure out, and, and especially if it's increasing. So it's five and then it's seven and it's 10 and it's 15 and you do a neck ultrasound and we can't find anything there and you do a chest CT and you can't find anything there. That is the next thing to do. So you, you have some on the TGs increasing, you can't figure out why. <clears throat> You've done all the testing you can do as far as non-radioactive iodine isotope labeled testing. That next test should be a I-123 whole body scan to help figure out why is the TG increasing and where is the disease. So it's a long answer, but most, many patients with low risk disease do not need a whole body scan um, in follow-up. You can be reassured and be comfortable that you've achieved remission using other data. Thank, thank you so much. And we have, I know a few minutes left, but we'll look in the um, chat here. Question. Uh, where is that genetic testing done for kids and is papillary thyroid cancer angioinvasive? The commercially available tests, there's a couple different companies uh, that do it. Um, and then there's some post testing too. I mean, we can provide that probably through, through Tyka, um, but most of the, most places will know where those are listed or at least I can give you a list of different labs that are available. So I, I mean, I can go through that or maybe provide that afterwards through Thycopan. I don't know how that's, mm -hmm. how we can do that. Can you send out information after if I send you a list? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. All right, um, so we can take care of that. And then um, the second question was? Is papillary thyroid cancer angioinvasive? Oh, angioinvasive. Right. Yeah. Very uncommonly. So, you know, in the land of medicine, anything is possible. Most papillary thyroid cancer is lymphatic invasion. And so that's why it goes from the thyroid to lymph nodes and usually in a predictable pattern from the thyroid to the central neck, from the central neck to the lateral neck, from the lateral neck and to distant sites. Mm -hmm. So papillary thyroid cancer for the most part is um, lymphatic invasion. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm the moderator too of um, the support group for parents and caregivers of kids who have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. So that's my email. If you ever have any questions for me to um, let me know, we'll try to answer them. If you want to be part of our support group, we'd love to have you. So, okay. I guess that wraps it up. Um, yep. Thank you again. In that, list of, yep, yes. in that list of places to send, I'll also talk to Ted Leach, you know, the oncologist I work with and figure, see, try to put the instructions for the COG. Cause I just found out about that this week, but children's oncology group that's offering testing of all pediatric cancers, not just thyroid cancer. So I'll try to put that information and then maybe we can post it through Thyca or whatever. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much again, Dr. Bauer, for your generosity, your time. Um, you've devoted so much time, I know, and energy to us, um, to pediatric thyroid cancer. We really appreciate that. So fortunate to have you advocating for our kids. And again, you're greatly appreciated um, by us as parents and caregivers. So appreciate Thanks to everybody for joining now. Thank you. I love everybody. what I do and I have a great team. So mm -hmm. I'm part of Thyka, Thyka's part of us. Mm -hmm.